everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I loved creating it so much because it brought up all my old procrastination issues. And so in creating it, I had to go through the process again, the process that I used to uh, slay procrastination in my own life. And so it's extra authentic because I was going through it while I was creating the episode. And with that in mind, I made you a special guide that you can download so that you have sort of a cheat sheet to go through because you, if you are a procrastinator, you're probably going to have to, you're probably going to have to do this more than once. So listen to the episode, get lots of great ideas, and then the link to get the free guide is in the show notes. So check there. All righty, here we go. Welcome to the Parenting Successful Teens, the podcast that cuts through the overwhelm and stress of this phase and offers parents simple, practical, cognitive, science-based strategies for keeping their teens on track. Join master coach and real-life mom, Allie Irwin, to talk about real teens, real problems, and the skills it takes to raise successful adults. Hey, everybody. I just dragged myself off Facebook. I'm not even kidding. And I'll probably have to do that about 12 more times before I get this episode published. I'm a recovering procrastinator and I'm self-employed. So you can imagine how much work I've had to do on this issue. And I know a lot of my listeners and clients feel the same way. I know that because they hire me to help them with this very issue. One of the most common questions I get asked by my parents of teenagers is how to help their kids do a better job managing their time. And time management, what they're really asking most of the time is, how do I help my kids stop procrastinating? And parents are right to be concerned because one of the big things that kids should be learning in high school is how to manage their time. It's it's actually the perfect time to learn it because your workload has gone up from middle school but yet you still have all the structure of high school. You have a regular school day. You have people making sure that you go to class. You have um, regular checkpoints. You have power school. There's a lot of structure in high school. And if kids don't get a handle on how to manage their time in high school, when they go to college and the workload goes up again and then the structure falls away, those are the kids that struggle. In fact, this is a huge problem with very academically gifted kids is that they don't have to manage their time while in high school. The workload isn't challenging enough to force them to manage their time. And so they get admitted to colleges that are very academically rigorous, and then all of a sudden they have to study and they don't know how. So if you are a parent trying to help get a handle on procrastination for yourself and for your kids, you are definitely on the right track. As I was researching for today's episode, I was digging into psych journals and, you know, everything I'm pulling for these podcasts is not just like Ellie's good ideas. They're research backed and I'm trying to make sure that I'm bringing you the best information. So I was knee deep in psych journals. (laughs) (laughs) And one of them suggested highly structured cognitive behavioral therapy. And that just makes me laugh because if I was willing to do that, I wouldn't need it, right? The person who, it's like a chicken and the egg scenario. Like anyone who can complete highly structured cognitive behavioral therapy probably does not need help with procrastination. Or maybe they do need help, but the procrastination is so bad that you know, they, they've gone to these like more extreme measures. So today's podcast will not be that. It's, it's sort of for the rest of us, people who somehow manage to get it all done or at least get the important things done, but they just hate the drama of the process. So today I'm going to break procrastination into sort of two main buckets of reasons that we procrastinate. The first is the brain chemistry of procrastination. And the second is thought errors, ways that we're thinking that don't serve us or how we're thinking when we're procrastinating and how to shift our thinking to ways that will help us stop procrastinating. 
And we can start unraveling both reasons for procrastination with an explanation of our brain. (laughs) Big surprise, it all comes back to our brains. And my favorite explanation of procrastination comes not from those psych journals, but from a blog called Wait But Why. So these are Tim's ideas, but kind of with my own twist. The author of this blog, Tim Urban, says that there are different characters in our brain. And I like to think of these characters kind of like all in an SUV trying to go someplace. So the first character is the rational decision maker. And this character looks like a grown-up version of you on your best day. So for me, that she's got a real outfit on, no yoga pants, <laughs> pajamas, hair is brushed. She's got really good posture. She had a healthy breakfast. <laughs> and she's using her brain to make good decisions and think long term. And for non-procrastinators, she's running the show. Okay, this is who is driving the car, your rational decision maker. She knows where you want to go. She's put it in ways, how to get there. She's the driver. But for procrastinators like me, there's a second character in the car. And this character, uh, Tim calls him instant gratification monkey, but I like to picture him as kind of like a golden retriever puppy. So Instant gratification puppy is super cute. She's tons of fun and she only wants to play all the time. And there's nothing wrong with instant gratification puppy. Like play is a good thing. But instant gratification puppy should not be driving the car. (laughs) So when you are thinking about your procrastination, I want you to remember that phrase like don't let the dog drive the car. Because instant gratification puppy is only thinking about the present moment. She's ignoring all the lessons from the past, like all the times in the past where she procrastinated and it kind of ended badly. And she's disregarding the future altogether. She's not thinking about how late she's going to have to work if she doesn't get started now. Instant gratification puppy is entirely concerned with maximizing the ease and comfort and pleasure of the current moment. Okay, from a neuroscience standpoint, this is that old survival part of the brain that we talked about in the first episode, the part of the brain that is maximizing ease and comfort and sort of concerned with survival and having a good time, maximum pleasure, minimum effort. This puppy is never going to do things like order groceries or pay bills or for your kids, write college essays. And the bummer is that the rational decision maker driver is kind of ill equipped to handle all of the distractions from the puppy. Like if you've ever driven (laughs) with a barking dog in the car, you will know what I'm talking about. And so when there's this sort of battle going on between your rational decision maker that knows about your deadlines and knows you should get started now and the distracting puppy that's like, hey, let's go check Instagram. What happens is we go into gridlock. Now, we're all familiar with congressional gridlock, but the mental image that I want you to use today is if you've ever been in gridlock in traffic, where no one can move because there's cars in the intersection, and so when the light changes, like the other direction can't get through. And that happens in our brains too. Gridlock in your brain looks like the puppy and the driver both fighting for control of the car. Now, if the puppy was in charge, you'd be having fun, but you're not because the rational decision maker knows that you shouldn't be having fun now. You should be getting work done, and so you feel guilty. If the rational decision maker was in charge, you'd be getting your work done, but you're not because the dog won't let you. It just keeps barking. It's a mess and you're in gridlock. And this is why you end up checking Facebook 47 times a day or wandering into the break room for a snack when you aren't even really hungry. (laughs) Gridlock sucks for everyone because you're in this weird purgatory where you don't have actual fun because you feel too guilty and you can't get any real work done. For most people, the only thing that unsticks this gridlock is a deadline. Because both the puppy and the driver both fear deadlines. 
or more accurately, they fear the consequences of missing a deadline. So as the deadline gets closer, the puppy kind of quiets down and the driver is able to really focus and get things done. So what we're trying to do with today's episode is to better equip the driver so that she doesn't have to wait until the deadline to get control of the vehicle. So let's, let's talk about that for a quick second. Why is, that a, why is that a problem? You might be thinking right now, well, the deadline works, so what's the problem? There's a couple of problems. One, we cause so much stress on ourselves. Like we would just be so much better off emotionally if we trusted ourselves to do our work on schedule, okay? We would have more leisure time if we could get in, get our work done, and then leave work on time. And the quality of our work would be higher. If you just think about how many times you've slapped together a presentation at the last minute and how much better your presentations are the times when you've worked on it over a couple of days or a couple of weeks rather than just slapping something together like the hour before you're due to present. Okay, the quality of the work is higher and your life quality is higher because you're not so stressed out. Okay, so we're going to better equip the rational decision maker in you to deal with this barking dog's distractions. And the dog's main distraction weapon is innocent sounding thoughts like, this work is boring, let's do something more fun, or I hate doing this, or it won't be good enough anyway, my boss will just make me redo it, so why even bother? Or this other thing will just take one second. And then I'll come back to it, (laughs) which we know is not true. Nothing ever takes one second. It always takes a half an hour or an hour or the whole morning. And before you know it, it's time to go home. So you'll just work on it tomorrow. If those thoughts are the cause, then learning to manage those thoughts is the solution. Okay, that's where your rational decision maker comes into play. That's that executive function that I talked about in the first week. Okay, that's the main tool that they have to manage the the rest of your brain is to notice what you're thinking and then think new thoughts on purpose that will serve you better. Did you catch the first step there? In order to do this effectively, you have to first catch what you're thinking. When you get that urge to procrastinate and before you click on Facebook, you have to stop yourself and notice what am I thinking? Because it's that thought that's causing the urge to procrastinate. And without that thought, we can't equip the rational decision maker. So you have to catch yourself in that moment before you click on Facebook and notice what you're thinking. So if you've ever read the procrastination advice about deleting the app and making yourself log in every time, what The reason that works is because it's creating more time for you to notice the urge to click over to Facebook. It's creating like a space and making it take more effort so that you won't do it mindlessly. And what we're trying to do here is put our mind back in. We're trying to put that rational decision maker back in. Okay, mindless activity is the instant gratification puppy at its best. So... The next time you get the urge, you want to ask yourself, why don't I want to do the work? Your first answer might be something like, oh, because I don't know how. That's a go-to for a lot of perfectionist clients. They're afraid to get it wrong, and so they're afraid to start it. And if that's the answer that you're getting, you may have to dig a little bit deeper. Because not knowing how to do something and then not taking action becomes its own reinforcing loop, right? You don't learn how to do something by not doing it. You learn how to do something by doing it. So oftentimes what's underneath that thought is something like, I don't want to look stupid or I'm afraid it won't be good enough. That's very popular with high school kids because it's important to them to get it right. They're very conditioned to get excellent grades. And so not knowing how to do something feels like a big risk. It's kind of a 
a side effect of the culture to have a perfect resume when you head to college is that it's very risky to not know how to do something. And if you think about it, procrastination in those terms, it makes perfect sense why our kids are procrastinating. If you are taking very challenging subjects and you don't know how to do something and it's very important to get it exactly right and you're super concerned about how you appear to your peers, like that's a perfect storm for procrastination. There's this feeling of not knowing how to do something, which is exactly the reason they're students is because they don't already know how to do calculus or interpret the U.S. Constitution, and it's extremely important to get it right. So helping kids break down the thoughts that they're having about getting it wrong will help them avoid procrastinating doing the work. And it's the same for us as adults. When I thought about making this podcast, it was extremely important to me to make it useful. And so I just kept cramming stuff in and thinking the thought, like, I don't know how to trim this down to 20 minutes. Like, how do I, how do I give them everything they need and not have this be <laughs> three hours long? So while I was having the thought, I don't know how to trim this down, I avoided doing the work of recording it. So when you get that initial answer, something like, I don't know how, you may have to ask a follow-up question to get to the reason underneath. And one of my favorite questions to ask myself is, what am I trying to avoid? What am I trying to avoid when I'm avoiding this work? For your kids, that might be avoiding looking stupid, avoiding having to ask for help, So if you dig under and get that deeper reason, then the rational decision maker has more to work with. And the way that you know that you've got the reason is because when you think the thought, so you could can write down or you can just think them in your head, you can say them aloud. And when you say a thought, if that thought produces the same feeling you get when you're procrastinating, then you know you have the real reason, okay? So you say a thought like, I don't know how, and that feels maybe kind of flat, but then you ask the deeper level question and you say, well, I'm afraid that it's going to be terrible. I'm afraid that it's not going to be good enough. And it gives you that same feeling of dread that you get when you start to work on something, then you know you've got the real reason. And like I said, that real reason is the thing that the rational decision maker can use to get back in control of the car. Once you have the reason, then your next step is to brainstorm some other ways to think about the work. Okay, so going back to the example of I don't know how, you could say something like, well, I'm only going to figure it out by trying. Or I've always been able to figure things out in the past. Or I know someone that could help me figure this out. And you'll know that you've hit on the right thought when it passes two tests. The first is it has to be something that you already believe. Okay, positive thinking Um, The reason it doesn't work for a lot of people is they try to believe thoughts that they know aren't true, okay? You're too smart for that. So it has to be something that you already believe. And the second test is it has to be something that makes you feel better, okay? If you were feeling super anxious before, we're just trying to move up the scale. You don't have to get all the way to happy and calm. You just want to get to even a neutral place. You want to feel better enough to start the work. So you can say the thought aloud, just like you did with a negative thought, and just check to see how you feel. And if you feel better, then you've got your thought. And then the next step is to practice saying that thought. So all the while you're doing the work, when you get the urge to procrastinate, you want to repeat that thought to yourself until the project's done. Okay, it usually isn't a one and done. Like if you're really procrastinating about something, you're going to have to notice a couple of times 
and keep reminding yourself of the thought that you've chosen until the project's done. So with my example with a big project, I have to keep reminding myself, like, you don't have to do the whole thing right now. You just have to take the next step and keep like baby stepping my way through. And pretty soon that project gets some momentum and it's done. Woohoo! And here's the important part, the part that most people skip. You have to celebrate that you didn't procrastinate. This is the step that cements in the process. This is the step that makes it easier over time to get your brain to not procrastinate. Too many people finish a project and then they just go right back to work. Or worse yet, they beat themselves up for how long it took them to finish the project. Now, I know this has seemed like a silly example with the puppy and the driver, but there's real neuroscience behind this because the energy of celebration, of celebrating when you're done, is that dopamine release that the instant gratification puppy has been looking for all along. And so what you're doing here when you celebrate finishing a project and I mean, this can be as small as sending an email that you've been procrastinating. It doesn't have to be a big project. But when you celebrate, when you take a minute to acknowledge that you didn't procrastinate and you got it done, you're giving that instant gratification puppy the dopamine he was looking for. And he's associating the dopamine with finishing. Okay, that's the link that you're trying to make in your brain is associating that dopamine hit with finishing the project instead of with clicking over to Facebook. That's what will make this process easier and easier and easier over time until you find that you hardly procrastinate at all. Now, I'm not saying like you throw yourself a party for (laughs) finishing your presentation, but what I am saying is you reward yourself in some way. Sometimes that's a cappuccino. Sometimes it's uh, like I mentioned before, where you take five minutes and walk downstairs and walk outside. For me, sometimes that's a five minute guilt free Facebook break. And I have my clients make a list of things that they can do to celebrate because what you want to do if you give your brain that pleasure of celebration when you complete a project that you were procrastinating on, you're cementing in that you can do this. And over time, that cementing in will help you procrastinate less. So let me contrast it quickly with what most people do. So... (laughs) Most people finish a big project and then they beat themselves up that they procrastinated it all. Okay, so they finish the project and then they yell at themselves for how painful the process was, which just makes the process more painful and it cements in the idea that you are a procrastinator. Okay, then that becomes part of your identity. Or they immediately jump to the next project because they feel like they were so behind and that project took so long. Now they're behind and they have to work extra hard. So there is literally no reward in their brain for finishing the project. Hey, take a second and notice, is that you? And the answer is probably yes, because I have heard this from so many clients. They will literally say, like, there's no reason to get this done because there's just a hundred other things waiting on its heels. Okay, the work is endless. Your kids feel this way, you feel this way, unless you consciously take a moment and celebrate your success, celebrate finishing the project. Okay, this doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to take a long time, but it's crucial to breaking the procrastination habit and starting to view yourself as someone who doesn't procrastinate. This kind of shift is totally possible for you. I know that because I have helped so many people with that exact process that we just went through. I know you can do it. And it's imperative that we shift our identities and shift our kids' identities as people who manage their time well. If we want to reach our goals, we absolutely have to change this. And if we want to help our kids be successful, 
in whatever comes next for them after high school, after the structure of high school, we have to help them understand how to manage their time. And if you need more help managing your procrastination, what you should do next is schedule a mini session. Mini sessions are awesome. They're totally free and they're totally about you. What they are is a 20 minute call. You tell me what's going on and I help you figure out what your best next steps are. It's your chance to take this information from the podcast and make it personalized to you. So there's two ways to grab a mini session. Grab them now. <laughs> this podcast is new and they're, they're going to fill up. One is to check the show notes. There's a link in there that will take you directly to my calendar. So you can look at your calendar and look at my calendar and see when might work. Or the second is to shoot me an email at parentingsuccessfulteens at gmail.com and I will send you the link. So you email me, all it has to say is mini session and I will know what you need and I will shoot you back the link and then we'll find a time to hop on the phone and get you going. All right, that's what I've got for you this week. Enjoy and I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Parenting Successful Teens. If you enjoyed today's show, please head over to AllieIrwin.com slash talk, where you'll find a free guide that teaches you five different ways to get your teenagers to tell you about their day. Grab the guide and start having better conversations today.